Now, we're going to come to questions from the audience and we're starting with the lecture theatre that is not too far from here. Uh, in, in view of the fact there will be less runoff into our rivers, in view of the fact of increasing concern over food security, how much longer do we need to grow grapes for wine? How much longer do we need to go grapes or wine? Danny? I can answer oh. that. Um, and I'll be careful not to offend my wine grape growing members uh, now, but um, uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a relevant question. It's actually one that's important in this water debate because often it's, it's talked about the importance of the water market um, delivering uh, water to its highest value use. Now, that in itself is, is going to change. Wine grapes were a high value use uh, 10 years ago, it, they're di very difficult to make any money from at the moment. Um, and I think whilst we support the market-based system, and, and we certainly support the market and, and water trade, um, we do need to be cognizant of the fact that the highest value use is not necessarily the best value use when it comes to issues like food security. Uh, the, the rice industry, uh, when it's operating normally, feeds about 40 million people a day. Uh, the wine industry probably makes about 40 million people very happy, doesn't necessarily <laughs> feed them, though. Um, so I think... And then very sad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but ha having said that, though, I think it's important that uh, governments don't make decisions about what people can grow. Uh, I think the market will do that. Uh, farmers uh, will grow what they can uh, with the land and the water they've got available and all the other inputs, because, of course, water's only a, a minor input in, in some crops. Um, and uh, the community, the market, will decide what, uh, what demand there is for crops. And um, uh, I know Arlene is very strong on you know, uh, rejecting calls for people to, to, that say we should ban rice or cotton. And, uh, and I would agree. I think that's not something that government should be doing. People have been given a water entitlement. Let them do what they want with it within uh, reason um, and, uh, and let the market decide. Arlene? So you, you stole my thunder there, Danny. I was about to say it's a, it's a great question. And the question normally comes in the form of the same preamble and why do we continue to grow rice and cotton? Is it a suitable to be growing such water-hungry crops in a country like Australia? And the answer is, well, you know, if, if you go to a cotton grower and say, you're not allowed to grow cotton anymore, over. He'll grow sorghum or something else like that. And he'll use the same amount of water and take the same amount of, en of entitlement, um, but he'll just grow a crop which is less financially viable for him. So the issue here is not trying to tell farmers what they can and what they cannot grow. They should make those decisions based on the soil types, on commodity prices and other drivers. The issue here is to use the Act in the Basin Plan to make a reallocation of enough water back from environment, back from irrigation to the environment so that the environment is able to sustain itself we should be really clear and honest and transparent with farmers. This is how much water you've got. These are some of the circumstances under which you can use it and then leave them to make the decisions about what they want to grow for themselves. The issue is one of providing adequately for the environment and then leave farmers to make those decisions on their own basis. Okay. And I mean, who, who would decide anyway? Who, who would give themselves the authority or who would have the authority to say, you can't grow that anymore? Wouldn't be you, Barry, would it? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, well, one more question. Our, it's not our responsibility, Kerry. I mean, that's very much so. One more question from room two. I'm a farmer in northeastern Victoria. I was very annoyed when the, uh, the government extinguished the rights of upper catchment farmers to harvest water off their land without having to buy it off the public system. In fact, I was so annoyed, I rang the ABC. I was given about four days notice by David Dole, who's a, uh, an engineer I respect on the Murray-Darling uh, Authority. And he said that uh, the biggest mistake that was made in the water trading was that the sleeper licenses were rendered tradable uh, when they should have been extinguished while they had little value. That's contributed to the uh, over-allocation problem that we have that's now being compounded by climate change. And on that morning I was so annoyed I rang Marius Cummings and I offered a billion dollars in ten dollar notes in brown paper bags to any politician in the Victorian upper house that would vote against the farm dams legislation because it didn't allow a reasonable amount of water for 
any farmer in the basin. And in the submission I wrote, I said, any water sold outside the basin to cities, and I was a bit prophetic when I thought that that was going to happen, I said any water that's sold outside the basin to cities that have an unlimited supply in the sea should be laced with a contraceptive. Now, I am going to ask you to come to the question. Okay, the question is, how long will it be before the oil billionaires own all the water that's traded in the basin? Who would like to have a crack at that, Neil? <laughs> <laughs> Barry? How, how does anyone know? I mean, it, it, if, it's, if it's a market-based approach, then they've obviously got to be some checks and balances. I mean, we do that in real estate, in a whole range, land, land acquisition, uh, companies. Um, it'll probably happen that way. I mean, there's, there's money to be made, and uh, sure as heck there'll be people who want to get into the, the market and, um, and trade. Danny, have you got a, yep. Yeah, I, I think there has been quite a bit of concern in the past about water barons, and um, I'm no economist here, so tell me if I'll get any of this wrong, but... Um, he the, will. The, the, the concern, yeah, the concern has generally been about someone buying up a whole lot of water and quartering the market, basically, and, and, and either directing how it's used or stopping um, us from producing food with it, and, and then, and profiteering from it by trading on the market. The profiteering will work in the midst of a drought when temporary water goes to $1,200 a megalitre, but it didn't work last year when it dropped to, there was offers at 50 cents a megalitre, when there's a lot of water around. And in, in the more normal years, mostly there'll be a better dollar made from actually using the water to produce something than simply trying to corner the market and trade it. And I, I don't think, uh, from our perspective, as a, we actually discussed this issue briefly last week at our council meeting, uh, and most of our members are not afraid of foreign investment, I'll get, we're certainly you know, cautiously watching it like everyone else does, but um, I think uh, foreign investment's uh, not a bad thing, and, and our view is if there's a market in water, then people should be able to buy, it, to buy into it, um, provided they're consistent with the, the laws of this country. Okay, I'll take a question from there. We've got a couple of microphones if, and from there. Thanks, Kerry. Um, Lawrence Hennever from Mitter Mitter. Um, I'll keep my question short, but I'll have to have a preamble for it. Uh, it's very pleasing to hear the panel tonight say how complex the issue is. And no, nobody, I don't think, totally understands the whole of the, uh, the basin. And, uh, but a lot of us understand our own little corner. In 1977, the Dartmouth Dam was completed on the Middle River River and uh, started storing water. And it <laughs> turned the, the valley inside out and the river upside down. And the people that fought for the valley, the whole river environment, were the farmers. No, no green for, for people from the green movement, the con conservation movement, the environmental movement. It was totally done by farmers. And over a period of 20 years, we changed the way the, the river and the dam was uh, operated. And for the, for the last 34 years, the river and the, the community have been learning to live with it. And I think the community is doing a better job than the river. The Dartmouth Dam is the largest dam on the Murray-Darling Basin system. And if there's going to be water allocated to the environment and to other, to other users, it's going to play a major part in it. What consideration is going to be given to the people in the Middle Valley when that occurs? So, Arlene, I'm going to come to you first. What consideration should be given? Oh, well, I, I mean, I think it's important to look at the basin on a, on a valley by valley and a catchment by catchment basis and to understand that every single valley is different. The environmental uh, uh, values and, and, and things which are important in that value, valley differ from valley to valley. The social structure, the communities, the industries that are there are all different. And of course, that's part of the challenge that, um, that Barry has in trying to put together the basin plan. There is no uniform set of problems across our different valleys and therefore there is no one-size-fits-all solution. And that's one of the, the challenges there is to try and um, find a solution which as the act requires, 
to protect and sustain the environmental assets and functions of every single valley, but to optimise those environmental outcomes with the social and the economic outcomes on a valley by valley basis. In, in terms of the specificities of your valley, I don't know, but it is one of the challenges that Barry has to make sure that each and every valley is looked at on its own merits. Very quickly. One of the things that is going to be very different uh, this time around, he says, uh, that from, the, from the guide, uh, is that we are really going to engage the community. We're, we're fair dinkum about that. I'll bet you we're, are. Well, well, <laughs> well, we tried. I don't think in, you're a slow learner, Barry. Inadequately. Um, but, but look, there's, n there's, there's a very real um, awareness that local solutions are part of the whole uh, way of which, uh, in which we do this. So the, the proposed basin plan, the draft, that, that's out in a couple of weeks' time, will in fact be hopefully understandable enough that you can make your submissions saying this will work, this won't work, it would be better if you do it, it this way. So there's, there's the op first opportunity and then there will be during that, that transition period 2012 to 2019, uh, I would hope a heck of a lot more discussion, local, local solutions. Yeah, quickly, Danny. Just briefly, I'm not sure if, if I maybe understand the question. Um, it hits a very important issue, and that is how you actually deliver the water. And so I, I think the question might be about if we're going to be sending lots of water down, yep, then it's going to have an impact on the Minamita Valley. Um, that's a critical question. I think was, with respect, not addressed well in the guide. Um, to, to, to get to get 125,000 megs into Chow on a floodplain just over the South Australian border is almost impossible without flooding a whole lot of communities along the way. And that's the reality of what we need to, to, to understand, that uh, we, we have changed the system. We've built towns and communities and farms all along it, and a lot of the things that would ideally be done for the environment simply can't be done without flooding people out. And that needs to be worked into, and that's why works and measures and other things uh, to, to allow us to get water to those key, key assets are critical. Yeah, yeah. So there's a number of responses there. One is to pick up on Neil's point before is that um, this is an opportunity for local communities to get involved because you know while we'll come up with a number the actual delivery of some of these flows as you say the infrastructure is currently not there to deliver some of the flows that the system requires. Um, managers have really struggled, you know, if they're, if they're thinking about, well, how do we get this much water to this wetland? They haven't really thought a lot about how they deliver that down the channel in a way that actually maximises. So you don't want to just be delivering the environmental benefit at the end point. You want it to be delivering environmental value all the way down. So how do you do that? Um, as you say, there's been infrastructure and farming practices developed around you know, the current operational method and a move to deliver large flows would mean the inundation of, of some properties. But that's not all down. <laughs> Floods are actually good for soil, they're good for productivity. Well, and it, graziers love it. That's yeah, right, sure. Graz, graziers love it. And so it, it is going to be a matter of, of looking at the overall cost and benefits associated with putting some land underwater and giving people an opportunity to adjust. And it may actually be that in 20 years' time, people are turning around and going, you know, the basin plan was fantastic for me because it, it floods these pastures for me and I get better productivity out of this than I did previously. But once again, unless you've got the local communities involved in actually developing that strategy and taking ownership of it, then you're just going to hit resistance all the way down the line. Okay, question. Uh, my name's David Evans. I come from the upper catchment of northeastern Victoria. A million megalitres of water comes off private land in that area into the system. That's about 8%. I'm interested in two statements that were made today. Um, Barry Hart said, we need to use water effectively and efficiently. We need more research and we need additional input. And then Danny O'Brien said, the real challenge is to produce the same amount of produce with less water. The best place to do that is in the upper catchment because so much of the water you need comes out of the sky. And that means that much less is used with supplementary irrigation to produce the same amount of result. At the moment there are very significant legislative and other barriers to achieving that, at least in Victoria. If I want to build a dam on my farm, I first have to buy the water for water that's never ever left my land. 
Then I have to build the dam, two to five thousand dollars per megalitre, and go through up to 22 different planning requirements in order to get a permit to do it, which can take up to three years, and I've got case studies. Just to give an indication of efficiency, using the grape industry, and I don't drink so I'm not uh, proposing for the wine industry, you'll get 12 to 15 tonnes for every megalitre of water in my area, right next door to me, out of every megalitre of water. You go down to Mildura and, and, uh, and Swan Hill and Bendigo, you'll get three to four tonnes. In the King Valley area, you use 0.7 of a megalitre of water to irrigate your grapes. Down around Mildura, three to four megalitres per hectare. So, can we come to a question? Yes. What I'm asking is whether these particular issues of efficiency of water use will be p uh, part of the consideration of the Murray-Darling Basin when it brings forward and whether they will consult with people from my area as to how best to achieve that. And will you still have to go to 23 planning authorities? Uh, yes, probably. We can actually reduce that by reducing the planning requirements. And that's a state government requirement. I, I was certainly getting at it from a different point of view. You're talking about efficiency of use at the farm. Yes. I was saying if, if we get this large amount of additional water for the environment, we've got to show, the, the environmental managers have to show that they can use it effectively and efficiently. So it was, it was more the other side of, uh, of, of the efficiency equation. Would you think therefore that my assumption that uh, water should be used efficiently and it's reasonable to have research is not a good assumption? No, I don't, I don't get the question. Can you give that to me again? Yeah. Would you say, therefore, that my uh, assumption on your comments that wa water should be used efficiently for irrigation is not a good assumption and that you would not be believe that that's a good idea? <laughs> no, of course not. No, of course not. No, of course okay. not. Well, we have no argument. No, 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 no definitely not. Thanks, Danny. Briefly, Danny. Uh, David, I saw you there. I knew this question was going to come. Last time David and I had this conversation... Um, uh, he Sit made, down, Dave. He <laughs> made... He made <laughs> Take the microphone from him quickly. <laughs> he, made, he made the point that he's, he's just made, that, he, that uh, you should use the water uh, at the top part of the catchment where it's more efficient. Only a week after that conversation, David, I was talking with a South Australian who said the water has to come down here for the environmental flow and to flush out the, the system and everything, so it's far more efficient to use it down here. Um, which just demonstrates to you the difficulty I have as a national body looking after all irrigators. Um, uh, I, I think, generally speaking, again, governments can't make decisions on where people should irrigate or farm. That should be up to, to people to do that. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm John Kew and Barry, I wonder if you can explain what's in the, in the latest guide or the new guide about the benefits, because that's what we're all here for. We've heard all about the pain. Um, what about the gain? You know, more fish, more trees, more birds? And also in socio-economic terms as well, in terms of you know more tourism, more angling, things like that. What, what's going to be in the plan for that? Yeah, well, well cer certainly we'll be attempting to do that. The, uh, I mean, the, the, the mo I think the most um, reasonable criticism against some of the earlier documents were, was that we really didn't p pin ping properly what the environmental benefits were. Um, certainly, th there are also a number of those benefits from additional environmental water for the community, as you say, tourism and so forth. Uh, yes, there are some reports partially addressing that question have, are, have already been published and some others that are in the pipeline that'll come out in the next, uh, I suppose, another, another month or so. So, yeah, definitely. Cost benefit in the broadest sense. A really important part of that, it's not just about sort of um, tourism and so on, it's trying to look at, at, the, at the environment and the sort of ecosystem services that the environment provides to all other landholders and land users. And, uh, and that's an area that's really underdone. We didn't ask the right questions at the right time and therefore we are lacking a big chunk of, of evidence to throw into the, to the mixing pot about costs and benefits and, and, and how you do the trade-offs that will inevitably have to be made. For example, a study that was coordinated by my organisation, the Australian Conservation Foundation, looked at the 16 internationally significant wetlands in the Murray-Darling Basin and the sort of ecosystem, the value of ecosystem services that comes from those. By those I mean water storage, water purification, the provision of habitat for useful species such as birds that eat grasshoppers and mice and so on. $2.1 billion every single year. So that's only those ecosystem services. That isn't even looking at the tourism benefits of, of, of natural places. So that's, that's one area of environmental benefit and the, the, the financial 
quantification of environmental benefit, which is so important, completely underdone, and is a real priority for the next few years and our first years of implementation of the plan. And I should say that there is a report being produced at the moment. The CSIRO have, have a contract from the MDBA to, to address exactly that, the ecosystem services, and what are the benefits uh, that will, will arise from those. I'm on the steering committee for it. Oh, yeah, right. Good idea. <laughs> uh, so you don't want to criticise it? <laughs> no, I'm there to criticise it. I bet he will. <laughs> no, that's the only reason I'm there, is to criticise it. OK. Uh, my name is Ray, Ray Stubbs, and I work with a network uh, group of councils in the Murrumbidgee and Murray Valleys, 18 uh, councils. Uh, most of those councils, of course, are the food bowl of the uh, southern Murray-Darling Basin. But I've got a curiosity question that I wanted to ask Ben. We had 10 years of drought and the environment suffered, um, farmers suffered, we didn't, weren't able to grow food um, and it didn't matter how much paper water entitlements people own, there simply wasn't enough water to, uh, to do all the watering we wanted to. Uh, and in the last year we've had a flood. My well, simple curiosity question is, what is the condition of all of those key environmental assets at the present time? Ben is glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, there's certainly been um, proof of their resilience, if you like. They have rebounded and the vegetation has um, recovered to some extent. But the issue is um, that they've only recovered to a certain extent. And if they went into another 10-year drought, we'd be, you know, they'd very quickly decline again because it's the wet periods that provide the resilience. So just as an example, if you've got a population of birds and it's reduced down to 10%, and they get one breeding event and they can only have one or two chicks each, you're, not going, you're going to get to 20% of where they were from that flood. It's actually going to take a sequence of wet events to really re, for the system to rebuild itself. And it's almost certainly the same for the fish. But asking me the question now, how has the system recovered, is not quite fair because you know, for the little fish to grow up into something that's catchable or, or an adult fish that's then capable of breeding and promoting the next generation, you're looking at four or five years. And so it's actually, the question really is, what's, what's the condition of the system going to be like in three or four years' time that will show us what an impact of a really wet year like that is going to be? And of course, a whole bunch of things will happen in the meantime which just make our lives challenging and interesting. So there, there is no doubt that there's been a major recovery of the system in response to that, to those broad-scale floods. But there's it could also, be extremely short term. It could be also. It also could be extremely short term. But the other, the other really interesting thing that happened during that flood was we had the largest blackwater event that we've ever seen. So large sections of the river had almost no oxygen in them, and we're pretty sure that that meant that it was a pretty bad time for fish to have babies. Because if you're laying little eggs and they're hatching into little fish and there's no oxygen around, it's not you know not an ideal nursery environment. So it is possible that while the birds did okay out of it, that the fish may have actually failed to recruit out of that event at all, which would mean that the fish community may actually still be in quite a degraded condition. But once again, we won't know that for two, three, four years. So some bits of the system obviously have rebounded really well, other bits the jury's still out and will be out for some time. Yeah, we're getting close to time. I'll, I'll try and fit in as many questions as I can. Questions brief and we'll try and be efficient on the panel. Alan Lapman, uh, former independent for Indi. Um, Given that we, we live on the arguably the driest continent on Earth and we use three times per, as much water per capita than anywhere else on the Earth, are we seriously considering population or should we be considering population limits given that um, uh, we all want our share of water and we have a very limited resource on our particular content? Now, if we're not going to tell farmers uh, how to irrigate or how much water to have, <laughs> how are we going to tell them how many kids to have? <laughs> Here's the question for who wants to take this one? <laughs> That's well, an economist I, I, I'm, question, I'm, isn't I'm, it? I'm happy to respond in, in terms of, I think it comes back to a point that Arlene How many seasons of, uh, 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 how many floods do we need? What is the human equation in this one? <laughs> well, I think it really is about defining what we want from the system um, and then working out what the water re required to deliver that and then working down the chain to be before you get to a solution. And obviously a population reduction is one potential solution. It's not going to be a particularly politically acceptable solution. 
but there are going to be other solutions to being more efficient with the use of water or using water multiple times um, or you know, investing in technology that will actually you know, desalination plants or, or recycling of water through whatever technology. So it, to, to put your faith in, in one particular solution, particularly a large broad scale solution like One Child for Everyone, is probably not the way to go. The way to go is to invest in a whole diversity of solutions to try and make better use of water, find ways of improving what it, um, the, the way that we use water and our relationship with water, but being very clear about the environment and the world that we want to live in and providing incentives for then for people to actually come up with solutions for that. If, if you then, you know, all other solutions fail, then you might head for a really politically unacceptable one like population control. Can I just yes, add, yes. If I could add to that, I, I think probably the biggest challenge that we've got in the next um, couple of iterations of this basin plan is climate change. Um, we, and it's quite uncertainty, uncertain as to where we're going to hit in the next 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. But gosh, if you look at some of the predictions from CSIRO uh, of the changes in southeast Australia, um, that means there's going to be less water. No question there's going to be less water. That's a huge challenge for us to maintain the same, or hopefully the same amount of productivity, agricultural productivity, same you, sorts Barry, of communities. As, 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 and, both, as both a scientist and as a member of the authority, do you really believe that is feasible? Feasible to maintain, maintain yes. Um, up to a point, I do. Uh, if you look at the dairy industry in Northern Victoria over the last 20 odd years, they have, the, and they've got very good figures to, to prove it. Now, it might be that they had a bit of slack anyway, but they have double, uh, double production on half the water, no question. Now, whether that can continue, Kerry, I don't know, but, but you know, there's, there's huge innovation all, all sorts of things, you know, ad adversity brings out uh, the best. I, I honestly don't know where we'll end up. I think we're going to have some serious questions about whether, uh, particularly environmentally, whether we're going to be able to maintain the same extent of, of the environment. I think we're going to have to get very smart about our watering strategies, as Ben's been saying. Okay. One more question, if we have it, from the audience. Yes. Uh, John Freeband, University of Melbourne. Neil made the sort of comment that uh, you've really got to dig in deep to get efficiency. My question is, how should we design the management of environmental water? You've had debates about whether it's local or the region, but there are questions, should it be a government department or a government agency, or should we tender it out to the best person? There are also questions, should we have sustainable diversion limits or give the environmental water manager property rights just like a farmer? So have we sort of thought about what are the institutional structures to get value for water for the environment? Neil. If I can start, thanks John. Um, I think that was one of the things that should have been thought about in 2007 at the start of this adventure. Uh, there's been so much effort on how to uh, amass the environmental water holdings for the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder that nobody has given very much thought of how do you deliver that environmental water to where it's needed, when it's needed, given that it's already defined as irrigation water, and the ministers have said that they're not going to change any of those attributes. So th there's been the presumption there that if only you know, we could get hold of a big you know, pool of environmental water, we'd somehow magically be able to get it to where it's needed at the right time and place. Um, so very little thought was given to those institutional questions. Uh, the, the role of environmental water trusts. You know, who is the environmental water manager? Are these people elected or appointed or are they franchises? Um, how do they intersect with uh, regional development authorities and you know, regional organisations of councils, for example, who have land use controls? The, there's all those institutional questions that are absolutely critical to getting all this Commonwealth environmental water to where it's supposed to be needed to do what has to be done, that frankly, you know, we're only just beginning to think about, but it would have been a good thing to think about it earlier. Anyone else? Just, yep. just briefly on the second part of the question about giving uh, the environmental water holder property rights, the single biggest water property right holder is sitting in the room here, the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. <laughs> they own property rights. They've got a, a thousand gigalitres now, a thousand, yeah, a thousand gigalitres of, um, of entitlement. 
and there are issues, I guess, and, and Aileen and I have discussed this too, as to whether they should be exactly the same as the irrigation uh, sector. We would argue, certainly at the moment, they should should be, because if they're changed, it does have third-party third impacts on irrigators. Um, but the, the environment now is a very, very big property right holder. Aileen, that's a good and, thing. And, and quite rightly too, and, uh, and it was... Uh, it, it was Why did you need my of, prompt? <laughs> of fundamental importance in 2004 when we negotiated a national water initiative and, and the driver for irrigators was we want property rights in our water entitlement. Most of our business is based on this and we don't have a formal property right. And for a long time as well, you know, the environment said, well, we need more water, but how do you, how do, you do that? How do you do that reallocation? And irrigators would say, well, if you want my water, bring your checkbook. So the establishment of property rights across water for irrigators and for the environment is a fundamental tenet of fairness within the water industry, within, within, the, within the, um, the landscape of water and water management. And what's really important is that the environment gets treated in the same way as other water entitlement holders. There's currently a situation, it, it, several years ago, there was a, 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 a situation where Irrigators wanted to be able to sell water to each other, but didn't want water to be sold to the environment. The states, to a large degree, agreed with that. It took some time to get over that and to start governments buying water on behalf of the environment for the environment. Both New South Wales and Victoria maintain volumetric caps on how much water the environmental water holder can buy for the environment, and that is slowing down the process of reallocating water. So property rights are not normally something which environmentalists are very proud of or spruik, but in this case at least, very, very important to fixing the problem. Okay. Now, I was told, um, and I'm sorry if I've missed you, but um, that there was a question from over here amongst the students. Very, uh, very valid base to be hearing a question from, <laughs> since we all express concern about the next generation. Yes. My question is, how will putting more water into the river affect erosion? Because erosion rate around Coro at the moment is very, very high with the local recreational activities. So how will that be monitored and affected as well as putting, trying to, you know, um, put the health back into the river, but trying to um, preserve the riverbanks around it? Um, yep, so erosion has been a major issue and particularly um, exacerbated by things like um, constant water levels, installing dams, those sort of things have led to major channel changes and it's been one of the sort of sneaky changes that's been going on. The, the, the channel in this region of the river is still altering in response to the dams and the altered flow regime and it's taken you know, over 50 years to, to slowly, um, I think, broaden and, sh and get more shallow. And so when we start employing environmental flows, there is likely to be um, further channel changes, which may in some cases lead to erosion. But over the long term, because hopefully we'll be getting a more variable flow regime, that will help fix some of the problems. But we'll hopefully we'll also be encouraging vegetation to grow, you know, either directly through the influence of a variable flow regime, but also through a coordinated program of land management change through local landholders and CMAs that you, we may actually help start resolving some of those issues. Having said all that, so what we want to do is avoid unnatural erosion, but having said that, rivers evolve over time and part of that is that there will always be some measure of, of natural variation, and even though that's incredibly inconvenient for the people who are living on the river and have their fencing and whatever. But we don't want to stop that process altogether because it is part of the evolving process of the river that creates and maintains habitat and, and maintains its health. But you're right, there does need to be ongoing monitoring of that so that if we have changed the flow regime and the erosion gets worse, that we can then intervene and say, that's not what we want, let's work out what's driving that and alter the flow regime to help bring it back to within acceptable levels or desirable levels. And. Uh we have now evolved our way as a discussion tonight to the end. Uh, and uh, speaking for myself, because you'll all make up your own minds about what you take from this, but uh, I certainly have a greater understanding of the process ahead than I had before I started uh, reading up on this, coming into it tonight. And all I can say to all of the stakeholders is good luck. <laughs> It's a very long road ahead and there are so many variables, it's too much for me to get my head around. Particularly when you put in the equation of governments times terms of office 
times the amount of time it's going to take for this plan to take effect and all one can hope for is that somewhere along the line there will be some consistency of approach. Uh, my thanks, and I'll ask you all to express your thanks to our panellists tonight, to Neil Byron, to Barry Hart, to Ben Gorn, Arlene Harris-Buchan and Danny O'Brien. And I'm now going to call on uh, Professor Bruce Mann to finish the night's proceedings on behalf of the Mann family. Uh, thanks, Kerry. On behalf of the Mann family, um, uh, again, very pleased to be here um, thanking the La Trobe University for continuing to um, put on and support the, the Jonathan Mann lecture series. Um, as I've said before, I, I continue to be uh, very impressed with the, the wisdom of my father in initiating this uh, 19 years ago, uh, realising just how important uh, the river is. Uh, this has been an outstanding uh, Jonathan Mann uh, lecture, or I, we can't quite call it a lecture anymore. Uh, Kerry, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, sitting here, I was impressed by uh, the collective wisdom of the people and the genuine commitment to, to putting in uh, expressing five different approaches to a problem that is clearly deep, it's clearly critical to um, our, the future of not only the communities but the whole family, uh, not the whole family, the whole country. Um, we, that are, wisdom, we are a family. We, we are a family. <laughs> um, it gives me, it gives me uh, a lot of hope to see the, the, the brain power approaching this from many points of view. Um, but I guess what worried me was your observation that the electoral cycle is 2.4 years, the comment that in the end it's a political decision, uh, whether we have enough wisdom present in that political process to do it, um, that is of concern. However, Lynn has uh, a bottle of uh, extremely water-dense, <laughs> a water-dense agricultural product for each of you. And on behalf of the audience uh, and everyone here, thank you very much. Thank you.